Um, so I'll open the um, floor for the discussion or either online or in the hall. Does anyone have any comments? Well, apparently, Malcolm, there are no questions. Um, so what I'm going to do now is actually, just for a short time, throw the discussion open generally for the papers that we've had today. If anybody has um, a comment um, uh, on or something they would like to discuss uh, at the end of the day. And otherwise, we can pick them up again tomorrow, so don't, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So I see Manfred's uh, hand up. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Malcolm. I missed that. Yes. <laughs> uh, his microphone is not. Uh, Ma uh, Manfred, your microphone is muted again. Can you unmute? No, that was your video which just disappeared. Uh, we need your microphone. No, yeah. That is the video, it's okay. Yeah. Video is fine. So click on the left hand side of your own little picture, bottom left. There's a, you did it before very well. <laughs> uh, maybe not. Okay. No, there you go. Well done. Finally, yes. Anyway, I refer to the uh, to uh, a lecture in the morning uh, concerning um, a, a mutual uh, investigation. If uh, at uh, Thera there are there is ceramic or other objects which were uh, imported either from the Levant or from from Egypt, I would like to mention the. There is a very delicate uh, stone vessel, which already uh, Peter Warren uh, has uh, taken uh, notice about it. It's uh, not uh, it's Egyptian alabaster, or it is uh, uh, anyway. It's not a real alabaster, uh, but it is uh, surely an Egyptian work. Uh, it is um, too fine. I mean, there are also in the Levant um, some copies of, of, of Egyptian alabaster vessels, but this is too fine, too perfect, and especially the handles. I mean, we, we didn't find a good uh, uh, parallel from Egypt itself, um, but uh, these kind of vessels are not so frequent. They are rare. And uh, what we can see is uh, uh, the uh, striations on the back of the handle, uh, they are perfectly Egyptian. This piece is an Egyptian import uh, to uh, Thera. And uh, I think one should uh, perhaps try with uh, scientific methods to identify from where this vessel came from. But uh, by uh, typology, it's an Egyptian vessel and uh, new, new Kingdom, by the way. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Can I ask a question just to our, our Egyptian friends? I mean, haven't you done any micromorphology from like your early New Kingdom layers to find like Thera Nash in recent years? I know that they did something a long time ago, from the Maranto, but uh, sort of there's nothing like micromorphology being done. I I didn't hear what you said. I was wondering for micromorphology samples that uh, Karen was. Uh, right, just just a uh, little more. Your name, sorry. Name. Yeah, no, the problem is uh, is in, in the Egyptian authorities uh, this this sampling actually, so that's a, a problem. 
Yeah, but I mean, one of the recent methods, for instance, is like when you do petrography, you could actually sometimes find ash in the petrography. And so there's no uh, possibility there. <clears throat> well, um, for the micromorphology, you need larger machines to cut. Uh, uh, for the for, for the photography, we can use a very small machine which we have, on mm. the and then we grind it down by hand. For the big uh, slides, you would need a, a machine that is really doing it properly. And uh, I don't know, maybe there is some available somewhere in Egypt. Yeah. But uh, they have the small one. I don't know if it's a big one. Yeah. But uh, what Jan was saying um, about um, ceramics, um, I've often wondered, uh, perhaps it's been done at, um, I mean, has, has any excavation that you've been on done it, Tom? And that is to look at the, um, the structure of uh, local pottery through time and see just when um, uh, th theorin ash ends up as an additive whether accidental or not, it doesn't matter. Because I would have thought there was potential for that. Um, yeah, I think you would have to pick a site. So I'm not aware of any oh. that has been done. But if you were to try it, you'd try it at a site like Gornia or Mothloss, hmm. big pottery producers where we have the kilns, pretty good stratigraphy. And uh, you, could, you could potentially look for hmm. Mothloss, I guess, would be the best, but really one being. Can you hear what people were saying? Can you? The women found ash in the different uh, in the artisan's borders. Yeah. So that okay. Would be okay. But it, I think it should be possible anyway. It's just something of interest to look forward to, perhaps. Uh, now, um, anyone else uh, online or not? So the diamond is going to go to Oblius. It's actually a reaction to the last two papers, uh, uh, question to Stuart Manning and uh, Marco. Uh, Stuart Manning emphasized that uh, uh, the uh, our huge efforts to estimate the uh, volcanic eruption uh, do make sense only if uh, uh, we try to uh, use it as a historical fact. It's the historical dimension that counts. Now, if we uh, let's assume that the volcanic eruption uh, uh, took place in uh, 1525 BC, the question is if we want to use it as a historical fact, is whether this dating uh, confirms what we traditionally think about uh, uh, the, the history of the late Bronze Age or uh, whether we have now to uh, write this history anew. Um, how do you think that uh, uh, a precise dating would change what we know about uh, the end of the LM1A and uh, uh, the, the subsequent period? what we know in terms of relative chronology, because we can uh, embed it within relative chronology with uh, uh, certainty, and we can uh, uh, think about the causal uh, relation of facts before and after. So do you think that uh, a uh, secure absolute dating would change the way we understand uh, the history in the Aegean? region. Now that was a question for both speakers or for one? For both. Yes, Stuart is. Uh, if you can put on your microphone and video. Or Malcolm. Yes. Uh, Colin, I, I wasn't quite able to hear the question, I'm afraid, but uh, uh, it, it seemed to uh, ask how how our view of uh, of the Bronze Age would change depending on the chronology. I've always had my exactly. wouldn't because I've always had the view that the date must be <laughs> around fifteen twenty five BC. I have written a paper on it entitled the uh, I guess it'll be published shortly if it hasn't entitled the Fateful Century, 
the the period between the eruption and the the uh, uh, LM2 mainland takeover of Crete uh, of what we know and what we don't know. And I'm now in the process of writing a paper uh, entitled Known Unknowns, uh, a phrase I borrowed from Donald Rumsfeld uh, <laughs> about uh, what we know we don't know about this period. Uh, but it is important to get the chronology right to begin with, to understand the relations with the uh, Pharaonic Egypt and uh, other civilizations. It, it is, and um, also, I mean, when I mentioned earlier um, after Stuart's paper about Middle Minoan 3A being a rather long period, I mean, I think I would like to bring down, uh, extend uh, later the Middle Minoan 3A period uh, and 3B. So, and also, I think because I'm fairly convinced that the Kayan lid is in a late Middle Minoan 3A context that the date of Kayan himself um, is of immense importance, and it's, it's rather difficult. Well, as you, as you will recall, 50 years ago, Sinclair Hood looked at uh, uh, what some were calling MM1B and said, but this is what I've always called early LM1A. Uh, 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 it, if one goes back to the literature, back to Sir Arthur Evans, um, it is. Uh, it does become uh, uh, rather confusing, um, uh, but uh, I have uh, no difficulty with a, a sort of brief period, as you're suggesting. Yes. Um, uh, uh, and uh, no doubt you're right about the Kion lid, but exactly where one places Kion is a bit of a problem, of course. Yes, that's why I was uh, questioning Manfred uh, about it anyway. Um, yeah. Now, any more questions? Uh, I have just a... <laughs> Your name. Pizzero uh, Fantuzzi here. Um, just a, a more remark now. Um, oh, I think what... Um, as is observable by the evolution of the debate also about this and other subjects in the last, at least in the last 20, 30 years, as I highlighted the fact that we are not yet in a phase where we have a real two-way deep communication between archaeologists and radiocarbonists. And uh, this is, I, I can just make two examples to to Sibotari. Uh, for example, noting um, seeds uh, from tell sites um, can, uh, can, be a, can be a problem because if the archaeologist sends a sample to the lab, say, okay, these seeds come from this stratum, uh, and some of them have uh, floated uh, in the strata, are re excavated uh, for any reason, and something which happens very often in tell sites. And uh, in the uh, person doing calibrated um, radiocarbon analysis doesn't know it, uh, of course, it will create a distortion of the results. And on the other hand, um, <clears throat> if we uh, take radiocarbon dates that distribute uh, over both partly on a steep portion of the cure and partly on a plateau, which is, for example, the cave of uh, the Santorini eruption. And we combine them to get a unique results. Of course, the probability of matter, the distribution will be shifted towards the narrow part and on the steeper part of the QR. And this has been demonstrated very well by Danuta Michinska, Adam Michinski. And this has significant uh, impacts on what we can for probability of dating, which is rather more a density distribution. And of course, an archaeologist that has for a result from a department lab doesn't have, may not have the background or even the time to go into that in concept of probability and distribution, which are very hard to know. And on the same hand, the, uh, the person running in the laboratory doesn't have maybe all the information to know if the stratum could be partially uh, modified, it could be intrusion uh, or else. So I think that uh, whatever technique we plan to use to, or method we want to use to combine radiocarbon with archaeological analysis, uh, it is crucial 
that this is a, a process is developed in a two way uh, dialogue and not just uh, taking the result of the assumption from one part or the other and accepting or refusing <laughs> the defense the conclusion of the other part. I, I think actually that's what Stuart Manning's test of time attempted to do um, if, to marry the the, the two sides, as it were, in, in much detail. Now, um, so Manfred Bitak has his hand up just now. Yeah. Uh, I, and then Malcolm. I addressed already the question of, uh, I think, uh, archaeological uh, markers or archaeological objects which uh, help to date certain, uh, certain contexts uh, should be taken much more serious by... Uh, people from the radiocarbon lobby, uh, particularly by Stuart Manning uh, or by Mr. Höfelmeier, uh, they use, to some extent, uh, very simple, uh, I mean, they dismiss very cogent uh, materials, just uh, they dismiss it. For instance, I mentioned already the stela of uh, Sesostris III, uh, from a, a specific uh, stratum in Teletaba. They say, well, maybe this, this uh, stela was uh, taken from somewhere else. What a nonsense. This stela is from this temple. It has the name of the temple and it uh, defines even the outlines of the temple. Uh, the same is true uh, for other, for instance, uh, when uh, the site of Avaris is abandoned. Uh, Mr. Höfelmeier says, well, we have uh, uh, no evidence, uh, no uh, inscribed evidence that this is uh, the end of Avaris. Uh, one should take some uh, common sense in uh, interpreting uh, archaeological uh, evidence. And also, the names of pharaohs are not imprinted on, on seeds, and seeds are transported very often upwards by any pits in archaeological sites. So uh, I would like to ask them to take uh, archaeological evidence much more serious and not to dismiss them uh, left-handed. And now, uh, Mr. Uh, Walter Kutscherer, who was the director of an AMS lab in Vienna, he's a very uh, renowned uh, scientist. He is of the opinion that because of this plateau in the 16th and in the 17th and 16th century, uh, in the calibration curve, the uh, eruption of Thera cannot be. Uh, cannot be solved. I mean, the, the dating of uh, the eruption of Thera cannot be dated by radiocarbon. He says this is, uh, he considers this uh, as, a, as a matter of uh, impossibility. And one should also take this very serious. One needs other sources, such as tree rings uh, or uh, the, the, uh, the ice cores in Greenland or even in, in other places. Anyway, I have a question to Stuart Manning. He showed uh, a calibration curve uh, which sinks very steeply from the 17th to the 16th century. Whereas, uh, if I'm uh, correct, the uh, calibration curve more or less goes in this period uh, horizontally. And I also have to to say that uh, the calibration curve, it was already mentioned by uh, Bernhard Weninger, uh, the calibration curve is too slick, too polished. Uh, and if you take the raw data, you see how many dates are outside this calibration curve. So uh, this means with the calibration curve, you create a precision which is not given. Uh, this uh, precision is not there uh, because uh, there are many so-called outliers. Uh, uh, you yourself showed uh, such a calibration curve from uh, from uh, Charlotte Pearson uh, uh, and her team. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm going to ask uh, Malcolm, who wanted to make a comment, and then I'll ask uh, Stuart to uh, respond. 
Uh, Malcolm, go ahead. Uh, yes, I wasn't uh, able to hear much of the question, but I did hear the suggestion that there's some conflict between scientists and archaeologists, uh, prehistorians. Uh, I don't think there is any conflict between uh, the best scientists and uh, prehistorians. Uh, for example, Charlotte Pearson, who has just won a major, uh, 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 highly competitive uh, 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 National Science Foundation Award, uh, is uh, thoroughly familiar and I think agrees with my work, and uh, as, as do some of the uh, best scientists at, uh, uh, at uh, the University of Bern and uh, at Mannheim. I, I don't accept at all that there's some uh, sharp uh, division between scientists as a whole and uh, prehistorians. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll hear Charlotte, of course, tomorrow. Um, Stuart, would you like to make any comments? Hi. Briefly, because I actually have to thank go into you. in about six minutes at this okay, point. Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, I uh, happily respect difference of opinion. Um, to Manfred's point, the curve I showed with the steep slope is simply in Cal 20. I haven't done any fiddling at all. That simply is in Cal 20. Um, to the point, though, should I have used the raw data and not in Cal 20? Um, this is a basic statistical question. Do you, you try to study the whole population or do you try and study the, the, the trend or mean within a population? In Cal 20 is a very sophisticated statistical product, which you know, although I'm one of the authors, I'm not the person involved in creating it. Um, this is the work of a number of different people, but it attempts to best describe a lot of data of which of course there is some noise you can try to use more ragged data and in fact in a paper that uh, myself and a current phd student we gave together in zurich a couple of months ago we demonstrated that in the last thousand years using such more ragged data actually gives more accurate wiggle matches this is this is true although of course they were remarkably similar they were just more accurate precise wiggle matches so simply arguing we should use the raw not the smooth incal data is not going to solve the fact that that's change in, in slope exists and is real. Um, I certainly am interested in the points about the longer middle Minoan three, and this is really interesting because clearly with Haiyan probably being one of the early rulers of the Hyksos, and obviously I subscribe to the likelihood that the Hyksos period is a little bit longer than the minimalist view, this starts to make for a very interesting period from basically in the 17th century, it becomes the Hyksos century, really, in terms of the East Mediterranean and cultural drivers in history. A lot of that's going to be Middle Minoan three, and then the second part of it's going to be Late Minoan 1A, and then we come to an eruption, which right now, if you're a betting person based on the radiocarbon, those who wish to ignore radiocarbon, fine, you might suggest it's going to be somewhere probably in the first quarter of the, the 16th century, and then we have beginning of the new kingdom very shortly afterwards and the question then is what happens around that period through to when we have the Cretan destructions and we have the whole rise of the mainland and Mycenaean Greece from later late Atlantic one through early 2a all fitting with that there's an historically interesting thing in which the theory eruption plays potentially an important not necessarily only part because one topic that I haven't heard mentioned by anybody goes back to, um, and Tom's paper actually really actually brought this up, we don't really know that the eruption occurs at the very end of late Minoan 1A. In fact, there are some pretty good arguments that maybe it doesn't, and this is back to Sinclair Hood's work, even um, papers 1970 and others, it may well be late in late Minoan 1A that occurs, there's then a periods of change and other change on the island. We see that in East Crete particularly, where late LM 1A through early LM 1B seems to be much less well-defined. So we might want to look at what we're trying to compare more closely. And it's obviously wrong, I think, to just say scientists say X, archaeologists say Y, but on both sides, we need to better define what we're talking about. So on the radiocarbon side, massive improvement has been made in the definition of some of the key issues in the last few years. On the archaeological side, I think we're only beginning to get a real handle on whether we can recognize late Minoan 1A as being the same in contemporary right across the island on Crete, and exactly what equals late Mono and 1B as the same and contemporary right across the island. And I think a lot of interest could focus on that period um, in historical and archaeological terms. Thank you very much. Um, hello, uh, good evening, everyone. I have just a small remark. Uh, 
Lui, Louis Dose a une PhD student uh, working on Egypto Egyptian relationship during the late Bronze Age. Um, just a small remark about the um, historical impact of Santorini in eruption that you you you, you said uh, stuff money. Um, actually, in Egypt, in the Egypt in Egypt some context, we didn't find any uh, middle minimum freebie and late minimum a uh, shared uh, any uh, eladic, uh, uh, late eladic one shared uh, too. So it's maybe uh, we found actually a middle minimum we a shared until the uh, 13th uh, dynasty, like in Mursa, uh, uh, uh C seaport. Uh, so it's maybe this implication that uh, after the eruption, there is like a Knappet uh, shows uh, some uh, redistribution of uh, maritime mm -hmm. contacts. And after this eruption, there is some import of late mean 1B from Tutmosid era uh, onwards, not before. So this is maybe this. Uh, historical impact, and that's why we do not find any. Uh, there is an absence of uh, of any shared of uh, a in Egypt, and uh, that's already uh, said that uh, uh, also Sarah called in a paper on uh, edited um, book on our dead treasure that it was published in here. That it's an absence, and maybe this absence uh, has an historical point of view. Uh, from, from this time. So maybe some thought uh, about that. And I have also just a small question to uh, uh, Kathleen, uh, uh, sorry, Kathleen Erickson, if she's there, um, about the, uh, the, the stone veils uh, bearing uh, the cartouche of Anose in uh, in Cyprus. I think it's stone uh, uh, 104 in Pyrographos. Uh, what is the, uh, the material uh, associated to the, this cartouche? Uh, um, uh, if it's late, she put one A, or I, I don't know, and I would like to, to know. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Catherine Erickson, would you like to respond at all? Hello, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It's, um, sorry, the question, sorry, I just uh, caught the end of that question. It was about um, the date, the context of the vase with the cartouche. Yes. It's in a, uh, it's in a tomb at Palo Um but The tomb itself, um, they were chamber tombs of the late Cypriot one period. And, um, uh, very disturbed and used in later periods, but the actual Cypriot material really spans late Cypriot 1A to B, and there's a little bit of um, late Cypriot 2, not much, very early white Cypriot 2. So the range is quite wide, but I still feel that it's, you're probably looking at late Cypriot 1, um, generally speaking, A to B. So okay, so, so it's not a great context, but you have it with early Cypriot material and with the two Manoan shirts. So, so it could be a, a good link between late Cypriot 1A, late Min 1A, and Amosi, or what else? No, I, I think I would be stretching it. Um, I really showed the tomb because it has this, the, the two shirts, one with the, um, axe, the double axe and one with the spiral, but I think there was a consensus that that might be later. Um, not the early type of double axe, but the sort of um, LM1B type uh, double axe. I'm not an expert on the non pottery. I'm interested in it, but not an expert. Sorry, it's dark in here. I just turned off the big light. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I, now, unless anybody has any uh, urgent question or comment just now, um, we should probably wrap it up for this evening and meet you all again here tomorrow at 9.30. Um, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Good night. Thank you.